Hey, Stacy David here with Tales of a Gearhead podcast. This podcast is about all things automotive from any time, any place, and beyond. All right, let's get to it. All right, today's podcast is not your typical podcast because this marks our 100th podcast. (laughs) I tell you what, we have been really, really fortunate that you guys have been listening to this podcast. You've been enjoying it. You endure my ramblings about all kinds of crazy things. So thank you for listening. Thank you for being involved with the podcast. And uh, we're going to keep it coming at you uh, indefinitely. As long as you want to listen to it, we'll keep putting them out. We have some really fun things coming up. Now, this podcast is going to air right before Christmas, ironically, which uh, I was like, you know, (laughs) we need to talk about Christmas for gearheads because I tell you what, some of my greatest automotive memories are around Christmas time, especially growing up. And I'm sure that a lot of you, male and female, can relate to this. We'll just jump into this a little bit. <laughs> it's like, I, my, I think my earliest Christmas memories, obviously there's like Christmas candy and stuff, but my Christmas memories, you know, always had to do with cars or trucks or tractors or something. I mean, my earliest toys were some sort of mechanical things. I mean, I wasn't interested in anything else. I mean, a pair of socks or something like that was like, really? Now, tell me you hadn't done this as a kid. You go over and fill the packages under the tree, and the ones that are soft, you're like, "Uh, uh, it's a (laughs) T-shirt. It's socks. It's underwear. It's like, uh, really? And that's from Grandma or whatever. You wanted those ones that rattled when you picked them up or that had substance. You could hear metal in there. Because that usually indicated some sort of car thing. Now, sometimes it would be something dumb like roller skates or something that you didn't want. But (laughs) most of the time, especially if you had your Christmas list out just right, it was some sort of automotive thing, some truck you had seen. And, uh, you know, I like my, my earliest trucks, you know, obviously were Tonkas. And, you know, dump trucks, tow trucks, that kind of thing, which is probably one of the reasons that I still love those kind of things. So that was my that was my earliest memories. And then Hot Wheels arrived on the scene. Hot Wheels, brand new. Hot Wheels, for you. Genuine, fiery. Hot Wheels, amazing, amazing. Genuine, fiery. Hot Wheels, 40, new. Genuine, fiery. Amazing, Hot oh my gosh. It changed every boy's afternoon, you know, what we played with for decades because it became the toy. You know, I was never much into the G.I. Joes. I had friends that were into those, and I just, you know, I wasn't into the the doll kind of thing. You know, and I know it wasn't a doll, it was an action figure. You know, now I like the Jeeps. And the helicopters and the equipment that the G.I. Joes had. But I just couldn't, you know, just the one figure. Now, speaking of Army Man, you remember the little green Army Man? Now, those were great. We'd get together and we'd have big battles and that kind of thing. And the good thing about the Army Man is that we discovered that if you took matches and heated them up, (laughs) you could do all kinds of damage and do all kinds of things to them. So, typical boys. We were very... I wouldn't say we were destructive, but we were. We just played really hard, and that meant that we were rough on stuff. I mean, we were jumping off roofs with, you know, guys with parachutes, the little guys, instead of just throwing them off the roof, we'd jump off with them and see if, you know, that parachute would help, and it wouldn't, obviously. But when the Hot Wheels came out, you know, that's some of my fondest memories. I remember I got the Sky Show, which was the— the custom fleet side that had a ramp on it and it would go down the track and you'd put these little gliders on there. You'd pull them back and lock them in place with a rubber band. And then as the truck went down the track, it would hit a special piece of track that would trigger an arm on the side of the truck and it would launch that airplane mid, mid run down the track. And, oh, it was cool. Of course, the airplanes didn't fly worth a hoot. 
and they were the first thing you lost. Oh my gosh, that was that was fun. I still have that custom fleet side, and ironically, it kind of looks like the Copperhead truck. It's kind of that orange, burnt orange color. So you know, is that an early influence that created that truck? Who knows? <laughs> I would say it probably is, but anyway. Then the snake and mongoose came out. You remember that? Don Prudhomme's snake. Tom McEwen's mongoose. Drag them's fastest duo goes from the drag strip to your home. It's Mattel's mongoose snake drag set. Just like the big ones. Get Hot Wheels mongoose snake drag set. Only from Mattel. And go with a winner. Yeah, the snake and mongoose race set. Then it became, you know, the drag races and all of that stuff that we did through the neighborhood. Um, Those were always great. And Hot Wheels were always a good thing to get me for Christmas. You know, you couldn't go wrong with that. And, um, you know, as things moved forward, you know, you got into model kits and everything. But these were like the pinnacle things that were kind of groundbreaking toys, Uh, especially, you know, growing up in my generation. And I'm sure you guys have them in yours, you know what those toys were. But then, you know, after a few years of playing with Hot Wheels and stuff, the next step was the Cox gas-powered cars and trucks. You guys remember those? Yeah. (laughs) I remember there was one Christmas, you know, I was probably, I was still in grade school, and my older brother gets this gas-powered P51 Mustang. Oh, man, that thing was awesome. And I remember dad, you know, he opened it up and I'm looking at that airplane going, how do I get one of those? You know, I'm looking at my Hot Wheels now. I'm like, "Eh." okay, so we're looking at this P-51 Mustang and it's just beautiful. It's green. You know, it's got the checkerboards on it. You guys remember the airplane. So they take it out of the box. And of course, dad was one of those guys that never really read the directions very much (laughs) and didn't really think things through a lot. (laughs) <laughs> so he just can't wait to see this thing run. So here we are in the living room, you know, and, and nobody knows how to do this. You know, he got the dry cell battery and he had the, the fuel and all that stuff. And having never fired these things up before, he didn't know what to expect. So here we are. It's, think Now imagine this. It's Christmas morning. You're past all of opening the presents. The excitement's kind of died down. Mom's in the kitchen, you know, and she's getting dinner ready, Christmas dinner. So it's probably around 10 o'clock, and it's just kind of that lull. Okay, well, Dad opens this box up with my older brother, and I'm standing there, and we're watching. And he gets this thing all ready to go, and he starts to flip the prop. You know, it had this little spring-loaded prop. (laughs) And all of a sudden, that thing takes off. Now, keep in mind, we're in the living room. And, you know, and he doesn't know how to shut it off. (laughs) So he's holding on to this P-51 Mustang. And the people are running. The dog's barking. And mom comes running out of the kitchen. She's like, what is going on? He's like, oh, we got the plane going. Well, Now, think of this. He's standing there holding the plane. My brothers, we all have our fingers in our ears because you can know what those things sounded like. Well, Dad doesn't know how to shut it off because there's not a way to stop these things. You don't grab the prop. (laughs) They'll cut your finger off. There's no shut off. I mean, you, you took them out and you flew them until they ran out of fuel and then they crashed to the ground, basically. So... Mom is like, take that thing outside. You know, so they're yelling over the top of this thing. And so out he goes with the airplane. It's like he's got a cat under his arm, except he's got a P-51 Mustang. That's You hear it outside. And, and finally, he's outside and it runs out of fuel and uh, it shuts off. And the house is filled with the, the smell of that uh, fuel. I thought it was wonderful. I'm, I'm loving it. Mom was like, okay. From now on, none of the toys get fired up in the house before we eat. (laughs) She laid the law down on him. Oh, it was hilarious. Great, great memory. And I'll tell you what, just in case you're wondering what happened to the airplane. Okay, so a few days later, I mean, they can't wait to take this out. And Dad's just as excited as my older brother. And, of course, I'm, 
you know, I'm hanging around just all eyes and ears. So we go out to the local school right, right close by, and we're out in the parking lot. Dad's going to fly this plane, and he's going to fly it first and then, you know, figure it out and then, you know, let my brother fly it. And we got some neighbor kid there that's going to th- launch the plane for him because it said in the directions, you know, you can either take this thing off of the ground or it's better if somebody just kind of throws it into the air as it takes off. Okay, so Dad's got it already. He's finally figured out how to tune the engines. I don't know if you guys remember those things, but they had the little needle valve that you had to adjust, and you got it to full throttle, so it's getting enough thrust. So he's out there, and he's got the circle, and it's for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, it's one of those U-control airplanes. It's got the two cords that go out there, and you, you operate the rudder, or not the rudder, but the elevator with it. And so the plane will go up and down. And um, so anyway, it's pretty simple. Most people have flown U-control aircraft and that kind of deal. But anyway, so we get out there. Now, keep in mind, we're on concrete in the parking lot of the school. It's cold. Okay, they get the airplane going. And, you know, Dad gets the needle valve adjusted, so it's going like this. And the one kid gets out and gets ready to throw it. Well, it's keep in mind, this plane is noisy and it's pulling and this... This other kid was just a friend of my brother's, so they're about the same age, you know, grade school. Well, nobody told this kid that you had to throw it, you know, you had to keep the the lines taut so the person controlling it, you know, could, could actually control the airplane, and you had to throw it out away to keep those lines taut. So there's my dad standing there. <laughs> And the the control cords are limp, laying on the ground, and the kid just throws it forward. <laughs> so the plane takes off, you know, and the, the the lines are all slack. So Dad, you know, takes about five steps real immediately, trying to get some, you know, tautness in the line so he can control the airplane. So the airplane goes straight up in the air, and then comes straight back down and goes nose first into the concrete and goes into a thousand pieces. Just. (laughs) And so here we are, and this thing is a total, total wreck. There is nothing salvageable because it was cold and it was that hard plastic. This thing hit and shattered like an egg. It went everywhere. And my brother's sitting there looking at every, and there was silence for a moment. And I'm like thinking in my head, man, I'm glad that wasn't my Christmas present. (laughs) Oh, my brother was so ticked. He looks at dad. He goes, well, do I get another one? Dad's like, no, that was there weren't any more at the store. (laughs) Oh, so there's that story. I think that year I got an electric train. Now, see, I got into electric trains there for a while. And I still have all of that electric train stuff. I never have gotten a chance to build a really cool train layout because we never had room in the house or whatever. So it's most of that stuff is still in boxes. And over the years, I've just collected train stuff. And one of these days, I'll set up a room with some train stuff, hopefully. If not, you know, I'll, I'll trade it or do something with it. But anyway, back to the Cox airplanes and stuff. I, of course, I got into those, and I had the helicopters, and I had the airplanes, and then I got into the cars, you know, the dune buggies and all that stuff, and I loved those. Uh, they were fun. The problem is you had to run after them because they were just free running, you know, but that made it fun. You guys now, you know, everybody has radio control stuff. This was long before radio control was going on, so you know, you would preset these things like the dune buggy. You'd set the steering in a circle or a figure eight, and it would just do that circle, and you just kind of, you know, when you got ready to grab it, you just grab it. And they didn't go very fast, you know, so you could actually run them down. Unless you mess with those tether cars. Now, those tether cars, you know, they go around a circle. And they, they were dangerous. They were cool, though. <laughs> but anyway, that's some of my... Uh, my early Christmas stuff. So the question for you guys is, what are some of your Christmas memories? And did it involve cars? And did it involve trucks and that kind of thing? And the question is, did it help put you down a path of being a car person? It definitely did for me. 
And all of these experiences, you know, like I said, you started out with the non-powered things like Hot Wheels and stuff when you were younger. And then you started to get into building models, which taught you the way things were put together. You learned about suspensions in cars and the way motors are put together. And then you start going to electric-powered things, gas-powered things, and then pretty soon you're out there messing with a motorcycle or a go-kart, and pretty soon you're into a car, uh, your first car, that kind of thing. So these are definitely things that start you down that path. So I want to encourage you fathers and mothers out there, if you've got a young boy or girl that is mechanically oriented, and you can tell it real quick. They're the one that's tearing the, apart the, the mixer or are fascinated watching the, the mixer go round and round. That's a mechanically based person. Man, if you get them a toy like that that is going to encourage that, boy, they'll jump right onto that and they'll just gravitate to it. Now, you might think, oh, well, I don't, there's no toys like that anymore. And unfortunately, that's kind of right. It's kind of hard to find some of that stuff. But, you know, I know that there's a lot of things with Legos. And of course, when I was growing up, you know, you didn't want Legos because basically you built a square box or a house. And that's all you could do with Legos. Not anymore. I mean, you guys have seen the kits. They've got the Millennium Falcon. They've got, you know, Star Trek stuff. They've got Ferraris. I mean, you can get kits to do just about anything with those now. So that's cool. And that uh, keeps the mechanical aspect going for these kids. So I encourage you to get out there and do that. I know a lot of you guys, you know, guns were a big part, you know, growing up. Out West, especially, my dad was a competitive shooter for the military, so there were guns around the house all the time. And, of course, we were taught gun safety, you know, about the time you learned how to tie your shoes, you were learning gun safety out there. So uh, that's another mechanical aspect, because a gun is a mechanical thing. You know, it's a tool, just like anything else. So um, that's another area, you know, where you can encourage a kid to get out and do something with. So I'd love to hear some of your stories. I'd love to hear some of the things that you can relate to. If you're hearing this around Christmas time, Merry Christmas to you. And once again, thanks for listening to the podcast. Can't get enough gears? Make sure to check out the Tales of a Gearhead podcast, where Stacy brings a lifetime of automotive knowledge, friendships, and expertise to the listener. Also check out our social media channels for updates and videos of Gears projects, as well as special contests, giveaways, and events. If you have a vehicle you want to enter into What Are You Working On, go to stacydavid.com and submit it. There's also the online store and tons of other gearhead information that will encourage you to get out there, build something, and go drive it. You know, one of the questions that we get a lot is about projects. You know, what we got coming up, you know, uh, where are existing projects, you know, what what you might be seeing on the show. And uh, we've got all kinds of stuff coming up. We have some returning projects coming up uh, for this season. We have uh, some new stuff that we'll be rolling in. We have some surprises. We have historical features, of course. We've got some specials that we're going to be doing um, on some movers and shakers and and some real interesting things. But let me give you a little uh, quick overview on some of these. The heavy metal tow truck, very, very popular project. It's disassembled. Uh, it's in the process of going back together, so you'll be seeing some of that this season. Uh, the SR-71 truck, once again, is disassembled like heavy metal, uh, doing some work on that. That one I have a lot more fabrication to do on. Uh, you'll probably see that one some this season. Uh, the Hot Rod Kid, the 40 Chevy Coupe, we're currently shooting shows on that right now. That is a fun project. And, you know, one of the cool things about that particular project is I, I really wanted to show people that it is possible to build a really cool, real hot rod, not spend a ton of money. It's not, it's not a down and dirty, you know, cheapo project, but it's a, it's a nice, reasonable project. It's the sort of project that most people want to do. You know, it's, it's funny when, when people get into projects these days, you have kind of two schools of thought. You have the guys that are like ultra budget oriented, like I'm not going to spend any money. I just want to build a piece of junk and get it running and just thrash it. Well, I didn't really grow up that way. I mean, if you're putting money into something, you don't want to thrash it. You want to enjoy it. I mean, and you want to use it hard. If you're going to race it, you get out and race it. That, in some person's mind, might be thrashing it, but it's not. It's using it for the way it was built. 
And if you're going to do any kind of thing like that, if you're going to build a vehicle and drive it on the street, you need to build it accordingly to where it's going to be safe and not leave you stranded. So it's not going to run out of gas. The wiring is going to work. The lights are going to work. The brakes are going to stop you. You know, it's going to be if, if you're going to travel in one air conditioning, that needs to work. You know, that kind of thing. If you're just going to have it as a weekend warrior, you know, tea bucket kind of thing, and it doesn't matter how it looks, it's just a beater. Well, yeah, then you don't need air conditioning. You don't need that. You don't even need it to look good if that's what you're into. But don't be upset if somebody comes up and goes, man, this thing looks like a piece of junk. If that's what you're after, that you'll be happy. But if that's not what you're after, don't get upset when they say that. <laughs> so the 40 Chevy, I'm trying to utilize as many iconic brands and products and names as possible to kind of pay tribute to this industry that uh, made hot rodding possible. And also uh, just got a lot of my friends involved, you know, in the industry from everybody from Gene Winfield to, you know, to Tim Strange to, you know, Troy Ladd. I mean, you name them. You know, as I run into them, I'll get some stuff from them. We've got Vaughn Hot Rod coming in here in a few weeks, and we're going to do some things with him. You know, it's just fun to to get with these guys and, and do something that, you know, reflects on the industry. Uh, then I've got several, you know, budget style builds coming in. Uh, I've got a couple of historical things. I've got a really fun thing rolling in on a new um, component car that's going to be released that I've been working with some guys for a couple of years. It's basically going to be a new replica of the McLaren M6 GT, which now I know a lot of you guys are like, what? what's that? You said McLaren. You said the big M word. It's like, yeah, if you remember the TV show Hardcastle and McCormick, Milton C. Hardcastle is a retired judge from the Los Angeles Superior Court. Mark McCormick, an ex-race car driver turned thief, was Hardcastle's last case. McCormick has been placed in the judge's custody, and together they're going after 200 cases that walked out of Hardcastle's courtroom on technicalities. <laughs> That Coyote, that was a kit car based off of what was the McLaren M6 GT. And, um, of course, it was Volkswagen-powered or Porsche-powered, depending on what stunt car they were using. The basic body was pretty accurate, but nobody's ever done a really good replica of the real M6 GT. Now, the reason that's important is that there was only three of those cars ever built. And at one time, it was the fastest production car in 1969. And um, Bruce McLaren's own personal car was one of them. And so there's a tremendous amount of history there. It's a tremendous car. Uh, it's just going to be really cool. And it's going to be something that you guys can purchase and build yourself. And it's not going to be stupid expensive. I know that was the first question. If everything goes as these guys are planning that are putting this together— it will be something that will be comparable to you know, a Factory 5 Cobra or something like that. So we will see how that comes out. But keep, in, uh, keep looking for that. That will come out this season. So as you can see, we got a lot of stuff coming out, uh, a lot of tech, a lot of vehicles coming in and out. I'm uh, going to tell the history of the Swamp Sprite. And I know you're wondering, what is the Swamp Sprite? Well, I'm not going to tell you. You're going <laughs> to have to watch the show or Google it. But that's not going to tell you anything. Because it's just, there's not much out there. So uh, we've got a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of things coming up and uh, having a great season. All right, that's our show for today, which means you need to get out there and start working on something. Spend some time turning wrenches. You'll love it. <laughs> also, make sure to check out our website, stacydavid.com. we got all kinds of new products, some great stuff there you're going to love. Also, make sure you check out our social media. That's Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, all at Official Stacy David. Our social media is where you're going to find all the bonus content, the giveaways, the contests, the trivia. We even have extra viewer projects that we show everybody to focus on what you're working on. YouTube is where you're going to be able to find all of our episodes of Gears Past, Present, and Future. I know a lot of you guys ask about that. That's where you can see them. All right, that's all we got. We'll see you next time.